Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from today. We're just going to give it a few minutes uh, as we go through the housekeeping uh, to let everyone join the room, but we're so grateful to have you here with us today. Uh, it's a beautiful spring day here in Ontario with a, a blizzard upon us. I hope you're, you're doing well and you're keeping warmer than us folks here in uh, poor Ontario. Um, this webinar is a very exciting one, and I'm, I'm thrilled to, uh, to be a part of it and to offer it to those in attendance today. Um, Advancing PKD Care in Today's Society. Uh, this webinar will dive into a series of resources that Dr. Mike Bevelapla and his team at BC Renal developed in British Columbia for AD PKD Care. These resources are to help with delivering more tailored services to AD PKD patients in kidney clinics. The goal is to put tools in place so that all kidney clinics can offer ADPKD specific care supported by a network of clinicians around the province. Dr. Bevelapo will explain how their plan was developed, how it will be implemented and what they've learned so far. And as mentioned, although this webinar relates to patient care in British Columbia, the information and resources shared today during this talk will be of value to patients nationwide. Uh, Dr. Mike Bevilacqua is a nephrologist with additional training in health administration and divides his time between clinical medicine and nephrology administration. His clinical nephrology practice is based in Surrey, British Columbia, and he is involved in several administrative roles with BC Renal. He is the chair of the Kidney Care Committee, which oversees the care of over 15,000 British Columbians living with chronic kidney disease, and he is also the medical lead for the BC Polycystic Kidney Disease Network, which aims to optimize management of PKD in British Columbia. Dr. Bevilacqua also works with the renal agency on other initiatives, such as improving the delivery and support of home dialysis therapies. When not doing clinical work or at the renal agency, Dr. Bevilacqua is involved in research with specific interests, in knowledge translation, systems improvement, and evaluating care delivery and is also actively involved in teaching at the medical school and residency levels at UBC. It's a lot to take on, but he always finds time to join us um, and to help the PKD community. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Bevilacqua. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jeff. It's always hard to sit there and listen to someone read out your bio here. You're kind, but thank you for that. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. I understand we have people from across the, the country, which is great. I won't even say what the weather is doing out here in BC compared to the, the snowstorm you're having in Ontario, because it's probably best not to, to rub that in. Um, but uh, thanks for joining everyone. And uh, you know we hope to have a, a great session here. Um, the other little point that I'll maybe add is, although um, you're, uh, you're unable to voice questions in because of the format here, please do stop it. Uh, I've got lots of time built in for that. And if you type it into the little Q&A box on the Zoom there, we'll make sure to get to them as, as time goes on. Um, yeah, but as, as Jeff said, so we're going to take you through what we've done in British Columbia with what we're calling our, our PKD network. Uh, and I'm going to take you right through the whole evolution of it, where we were starting from, what, what the state was before we did any of this, and what prompted us to, to take on this project of work. Um, and then we'll spend a, a bit of time discussing what it is that we've developed which hopefully will be of interest to people uh, in other provinces and hopefully other provinces will, will be able to follow a similar path at some point. We'll also share a whole bunch of tools we have and those ones definitely are freely available and anybody can go online and look at those. Um, and so I'll, I definitely will hope that people can get some, some value out of that. And then we'll take you through what we found so far. Um, now, when I talk about the, the PKD network, it is a whole host of people. And, and so I really wanna acknowledge this a couple of times here. Uh, this is not just me, this is not just my baby. There's a whole lot of people who have had a, a lot of work here. I've got pictures of some of our team here. I'm missing one of our patient partners, uh, Elise, who just wasn't able to get a picture into us. But we have three excellent patient partners who are okay with me mentioning their names, Elise, Heidi, and Paul, who have just been so instrumental in developing this, this network. They really, they really bring a, a lens to it that we don't have as healthcare professionals. So we're just eternally grateful to them. And then we have a host of, of healthcare professionals. It's a long list because it's, it's very specifically people from across the province and with different uh, uh, clinical backgrounds. I put pictures there of, of Sharon and Janet who are our project managers, who without, they're the ones who actually keep us in mind and make sure the work gets done. Uh, and then a whole lot of other people doing a lot of heavy lifting. So I just really wanna acknowledge that 
I'm presenting this, but there's a lot of people behind us this work. Um, now, before we get too much into the exact needs that led to our development of, of, the, of the PKD network, I just want to fill in a little bit about how BC works, because every province is a little bit different. Uh, and just it, it's kind of, you know, nice to think about this and to understand how, how your province works. And for those of you in other provinces, I, I kind of encourage you to do the same, because I think a lot of us have assumptions about how the healthcare system works, and the reality often is a little bit more or more uh, complex than, than that. And it's good to understand this because then that will inform what care gets delivered. Now in BC, the way it's set up is we have this, this group called BC Renal. It used to be called BC Renal Agency. Now it's just BC Renal because that's trendier. But at any rate, we're the organization that is responsible for the coordination of all kidney care across the province. So that means things like uh, our chronic kidney disease clinics, uh, dialysis treatments, medications, all of the kidney care. The one group it doesn't include is transplant, which falls under BC transplant, um, but otherwise it, it coordinates the rest of the care. Now, and, and you can see it's a large number of, of people here. Uh, you know, we have many, many thousands in our kidney clinics, which is my other job. We have you know, over 15 now, actually up to 16,000 patients uh, of, of registered. Now, the way that care is delivered, though, is it's what we call coordinated centrally, but delivered locally. And what that means is us at, involved with BC Renal. What we do is we set kind of care pathways, we develop some of the infrastructures and some of the tools that clinics use, but the local clinics are the ones who are actually the one delivering the day-to-day -day care. We have in British Columbia what we call health authorities. You can see from here this one that says six health authorities. Um, those are the little areas that are geographical split up so that they can best deliver the care locally, which I think is a good model because then you understand the local needs. But the important thing is that we're not directly one body that um, is implementing or directly running the clinics. We kind of say we think you should do it in this way, and then there's some flexibility to each clinic to kind of adapt that to their local needs. It, it seems like a kind of like I'm splitting hairs, but it is important to understand them when we're talking about having a provincial scope thing. It's not like it's one body of clinics that I can just dictate what's going to happen. We have to involve all of these various health authorities and make sure that, that these things work in all of those areas. We don't want to do something that just works in Vancouver or the lower mainland, but doesn't work uh, in the north, for example. It has to have that provincial scope and be modifiable so that every group can, can make something work. Um, and then to make it even more complex, what, what we say is that, so BC Renal that I just talked about, that's all uh, uh, kidney care. Well, that's all of our, you know, health authority run kidney care. Um, so this includes our chronic kidney disease clinics, our dialysis uh, programs and things like that. But we also have uh, nephrologists who kind of, we all work independently as well. So uh, all of us run our own individual offices. And that's, for example, where we would meet somebody the first time. Uh, and some of our patients might not go on to be into the kidney care clinic. Uh, so there's also a group of, of kidney care providers that work a little bit outside of BC Renal to add yet another layer of, of complexity. So this is the framework that we have in BC. Again, I would encourage people to understand their local framework so it does inform kind of the, the, how care is, is delivered. But to put that together, this is where I think we can start generalizing now. So I, I like to think in terms of pictures, and this is the picture that I, I've developed for, for PKD. And I think this applies equally to BC as it does everywhere else. So I have these series of, of, of circles. Um, oh, and actually maybe Jeff, you could just nod. Can you see my mouse when I'm pointing? Do you see it? Yeah, you okay, perfect. Um, so this, if I think of the world of PKD, what I mean by that is if I could, if I could magically know every single PK, person living with PKD in the province. In British Columbia, I would estimate there's actually upwards of 10,000 uh, people living with, with polycystic disease. If I could, magically know every single one of those, those people, I could put them into these various circles. And what I, what I mean by that is this outer circle, that would be if I knew every single individual who had polycystic disease, that would be the outermost circle. Well, the one that's then the next bar after that is people who are actually diagnosed because some people are living with the disease and they don't even know it yet. They haven't been tested. Maybe there's no family background, so they might not even know. So the next circle into that is the people who've actually had a diagnosis. Of those people who are diagnosed, not everybody has a nephrologist. Some just see their family physicians. And if I don't know about them as a nephrologist, I can't really do anything about their care. So the next bar is, do they actually have a kidney specialist? 
as I just mentioned before that, the next bar after that is, are they seen in one of our kidney clinics, in one of our BC renal clinics? Because not everybody who has a nephrology goes on to one of those clinics. And of the people in the clinics, you know, only some of them need very specialized treatments. And what I mean by that is that can include things like medications that we use. It could also include things like dialysis or transplants. Those are special, uh, special treatments. And why I put it in these various circles is the smaller the circle is, the better we know about these, about people in, in British Columbia. And the, the more of a, a kind of, you know, uh, idea of their care and trajectories and everything we have. So in other words, to, to put that a different way, we, I could tell you exactly how many transplant uh, patients are in British Columbia. I could tell you exactly how many people are on dialysis in British Columbia. We have very, very good records of that. I could also tell you exactly how many people attend our clinics. But then as I start to get out to people who are known to a nephrologist but don't attend the clinics, that gets a bit fuzzier because since they're not directly under our care, I don't really know about that. People who just see their family physicians, we have no idea about that because they're not in the nephrology world. And of course, we can't know people who aren't yet diagnosed. So when I think about these circles, they're not set things. And, and our job is, ideally, I want to push these circles outwards. I want to know more and more. And I want to make sure people have better and better access to these things that are, that are in the middle, these specialized treatments and clinics and things like that. So it's nice to kind of frame it this way because it, it tells us, you know, where what are the bars that we want to set and what are the groups of people we want to tackle and, and, and uh, as we're going about um, uh, working on, on, on PKD. And this kind of then starts to inform our need before we have the network. Um, what we did, and this is back in 2015, March of 2015, we went and looked and, you know, how many patients do we know who have polycystic disease in BC based on all of our records? We have, we have databases for kidney care in the province. And, and so what do we know? And we knew who was on dialysis and we knew who was on transplant. Like I said, I can tell you those people very, very accurately. But we only had a very small number of people who were not yet on either one of those treatments. And when you think about it, this has to be the tip of the iceberg for two reasons. I told you there would be up to 10,000 people in BC with, with, with polycystic disease. And this is obviously not adding up to 10,000. But also these people who are on dialysis and transplant, they have to be coming from somewhere. They don't just appear on dialysis. You know, they, they have the disease before that, but yet we didn't really know about many of these patients. This number should be much bigger than these numbers, but it wasn't. So we knew that we weren't really getting a full idea of the number of people living with the disease in the province. And at the same time, the care of polycystic disease has been getting more and more complex over the years. So between 2015 to now, things have really changed. If you look back even further, say 10 or 15 years, care of polycystic disease is dramatically different. And when I say more complex, there's things like we have better ways to uh, evaluate the disease, a whole bunch of things around imaging. We have new treatments. The research is changing every day. It used to be that maybe there'd be a, a paper every now and again out about polycystic disease. And now, now a month doesn't go by that there's a new uh, research study out. So things are rapidly, rapidly evolving and the care is becoming very complex. This is a great problem to have, right? When care is becoming complex, it means we actually have treatment strategies. We have management strategies that we didn't have before, but the field is, is rapidly evolving. Um, today, I'm not going too much into the detail about these items. There are other talks that we've, we've, we've done and, and some of them are available on the PKD Foundation website that go over the details of what I mean by that care. But just uh, for the purpose of today, we'll say that things are dramatically uh, more complex and dramatically better than where they were before. And I kind of put it into these little tongue-in-cheek pictures of, of, you know, this is what we used to do with polycystic disease. Even when I was in, in medical school and doing my training, you know, this is kind of what polycystic disease was from the healthcare perspective, is we would say, you know, we'd, we'll make sure we've got the right diagnosis. We'll make sure we're right about polycystic disease. We'll check everybody in the family. So we've always done a, a quite good job about that. Um, but then in terms of treatment, we'd say, well, you know, make sure you're drinking lots and make sure you're keeping on top of blood pressure and that's about that. Do your blood work. We'll keep seeing you. And when your kidney function starts going down, we're going to start talking about transplant and things like that. And that was about as much as we had to offer. It's not that people were doing a, a bad job. It's just we didn't have any other strategies to offer with, with polycystic disease. Whereas now it's much different. We have ways that we can ident uh, individualize what somebody's concerns are and try to address that. 
rather than just saying, oh, we'll see you when you see you, when your kidney function starts going down, we have ways of predicting what's going to happen to people. Um, so we can actually very specifically predict the person in front of me. Is this going to be someone who's got a, a more aggressive kind of, of, of experience with the disease or someone who's got a slower kind of experience? We can predict that very well. And then we have a whole host of treatments now. We have specific treatments that are disease modifying and we have treatments that we apply to everybody and we see what mix of, of treatments is the best fit for each person. So our care is actually much more tailored uh, with polycystic disease. Now, what, what we did, and this is what a group of us in, in British Columbia did, uh, this was just published last year, but the survey is actually a couple of years old now, is we said, okay, well, the, the care has become more complex, but, uh, or the management strategies, I should say, has become more complex. Uh, and there's a lot of new tools we have in polycystic disease, but has that actually made it into the real world? That was our question. We know that, that some of us are, are well aware of this, but, you know, there's, there's about 70 nephrologists across the province in BC, as you saw, there was, 15 different kidney clinics, has this translated everywhere? And so we did this survey of care providers and nephrologists specifically. Um, and we did find that, you know, there were some challenges. This hadn't quite made it across the province. Not everybody, not every nephrologist was confident in, in some of these new treatment strategies. These have only been around for a few years. You, this is not to fault anybody. It's like anything else. When something's brand new, it's only been around for a couple of years, there's going to be varying levels of comfort and not everybody has been used to it. Not everybody had the same expertise with seeing patients with polycystic disease. Some of us had a lot of patients. Some people had very few patients and didn't have the, the same experience there. And some of the clinics and some of the geographic areas just felt they didn't have the right tools on hand, whether that was access to imaging tests or tools to support their, their kidney clinic staff, like their nurses and dietitians and pharmacists. Some people just didn't have the things they needed that they felt to, that they would need on hand to develop the best or to, to deliver the best uh, polycystic disease care. So we found some challenges uh, across the province. So that's where we went back and put our thinking hats on. And we said, you know, well, how are we going to address this? And, and what we ultimately came up with was this idea of a polycystic disease network. So this would be a group of people across the province who would be uh, kind of unified and working together to imp implement the best possible polycystic disease care. And very, very specifically, we want this to be a provincial network. That's why we call it the BCPKD network. Uh, uh, different care models are done in different places. But, you know, my, my way of looking at this has been to say, you know, if, if we say that everybody in BC has to come see me or a handful of, of, of different PKD providers, we don't really have a provincial network. We have a couple of people who are offering services across the province. Whereas our goal here is to say right across BC, we want this to be available to everybody. And so you can see, I, I like pictures. So this is where we get pictures, but th this, is, this is what we're aiming for with our polycystic disease network uh, in the province. We, the outer rings here are kind of the cornerstones that we have something that's coordinated provincially, but delivered locally. It has to be where people uh, don't usually uh, receive their care and where they live. So delivered locally. We want to have this cycle of, of ongoing evaluation and improvement because for a lot of these things, there is no one right answer of how to do it. What we kind of need to do is, is start with our best, you know, uh, try at it, and then refine as we go, always be getting better at what we do. And then these inner circles, or these are kind of the pillars of what, what, what we wanted to do. So we need people to be more aware of polycystic disease. When we talk about pushing those rings and those further, further pictures, well, we don't know about somebody if they've never been diagnosed. Uh, so we need people to be aware of the disease and go looking for it and appropriately testing for it. We want them to be identified as early as possible, including identified to a nephrologist. We want these people, we want everybody to be seeing uh, uh, the right people for this, you know, to be seen a nephrologist. Um, we want within our care providers to feel comfortable with what we call modern uh, polycystic disease management, the, best, the new and updated tools, and we want to be able to deliver this within our multidisciplinary clinics. We have that nice established network of 15 clinics and 16,000 patients across the province. So we have a set network there. And within those clinics, we want people to be able to, de to, to, uh, develop, to deliver the best possible care. And, and the, the goal is for this to, to translate, obviously, into better care for people living with the disease. 
the way we evaluate that is to kind of look back at some of these pillars to say, are we actually, are our care providers getting better and better versed and better and better able to deliver uh, uh, care? Are we identifying people identifying people with the disease both are we identifying more and importantly are we identifying people earlier we don't just want to know about someone the day that they're getting ready for a transplant we want to know well in advance because that's when we're going to make a difference in their in their care over the course of their life and we want to make sure that we actually have been able with our clinics to develop these standardized uh, uh, resources so this is our network and the goals of this on, on, on a figure in terms of how we were going to do this, um, this is a, I, I don't like organization charts or anything, but this just shows that it's kind of a complex web when we're talking about doing something across the province. You don't need to understand um, every little bit about a BC Renal and how we report to the Ministry of Health and all that type of stuff. But the important thing is we have a relationship in this network where across our five health authorities and the 14, it's now actually up to 15, uh, at clinics, we went about and actually recruited what we call local clinical champions. So in every single clinic across the province, we had one or two or a couple of people who had a specific interest in polycystic disease who's kind of a point person in that clinic. And each of them feeds into what we call our advisory group. So you can see now that what, what we've tried to establish is to have someone everywhere in the province that's interconnected. We don't want to just make a bunch of tools and send someone off to to a, you know, a, a far flung area of the province and never see them again. We wanna make sure that they're always connected with the group and that we have someone embedded in every local area. We had a whole host of that. And then when I say this, this is the advisory group and we have this, all these working groups, that's just to, to show you that we had a whole bunch of different people working on different areas of polycystic disease care. That's how we got to that big long list of names on the first uh, screen there. It's because uh, we, uh, depending on everybody's expertise, we had them working on strong suit to feed into this one group with the goal of, of improving care across the, the disease spectrum. So I think this is this concept of a network is, a, is an important one. We've modeled this off of other diseases. Uh, for, for example, in British Columbia, we have uh, what we call a glomerulonephritis network. So another type of rarer uh, kidney disease um, that we make sure to interconnect uh, clinicians. And in BC, with, the, with polycystic disease, we actually want to step further than that. By making sure that we had somebody in every single place who was teed in. And I think, I think that's the model that, we, that needs to be done is, is people collaborating and working together on an ongoing basis rather than just here's the tools, go off and do it. Um, now I'm showing it on a bunch of pictures, and it looks like you know it's pretty straightforward, but it's been over five years to get to this point uh, of work. We started with first we had to figure out where we were at. This was kind of our current state assessment where we figured out uh, that we didn't know about uh, everybody living with the disease and there were gaps of care. Then we had to come up with a structure to do it. And a whole bunch of people uh, worked on all these various tools. This was basically a, a year long item. You can see that we had the first services offered in a clinic. I always say that's almost cheating because that was my uh, clinic and you've only gone so far if you're only the one doing it yourself. The real trick is, can you get other people to do it as well? You know, it's easy to do something alone, but you need to, it's much harder to get a province of people doing things. Um, and, and that's where we eventually got to by 2020, where we had this group of clinicians connected across the province and everybody now starting to deliver, uh, deliver care. So let's go into some of the nitty gritty of the things we got developed. And this is, this is where I think that um, uh, some of these tools it's all available online. Hopefully people can look through and, and, and read through. And even if you, if you like, bring this back to, to, to your clinic and say, oh, have you heard about this? And you know, maybe this is, this is a good thing to be thinking about. So we, just as just to reiterate that, that our goal when we're developing all of these tools and we're gonna talk about our best practices was, this is how I would phrase it in one sentence, is the best possible polycystic disease care but delivered close to home. That's, that's every, everything that we made. It's kind of going back to that one sentence and saying, does this fit that goal? Um, and again, we, we, we kind of worked on this, this talk about this uh, uh, clinician network across the province. Um, I don't think, I, I've kind of already done this as a little bit of a duplication, but one of the specific items that we, we talk about is that this really, everything that we're trying to achieve here with modern polycystic disease care, 
aligns very nicely with our, our, our kidney clinics. So when I say KCCs, that's, that's our abbreviation for our kidney care clinics, our multidisciplinary uh, kidney disease clinics in the province. Um, we have set goals for this. We have a very well-established network of it. And everything that we want to do now with polycystic disease aligns perfectly with this. We're talking about early identification and early care, individualized evaluation of progression, a group of different uh, professionals, dietitians, social workers, nurses, pharmacists, a group of different people, each focusing on their expertise to make a better uh, bundle of care for the patient. This is what we've always done in our kidney clinic. So what we're talking about with polycystic disease, although the exact tools and strategies might be a little bit different, the philosophy of care is exactly the same as what we've always done. And it's important because the first and the biggest thing that we did was develop this, this big guide of, of uh, best practices for polycystic disease uh, care. And put it side by side with this one here is our best practices for kidney care clinics. So we've had this for many years. This is, what I, this is what I call the Bible of kidney clinics. It basically takes you through everything about how to run uh, a, a kidney clinic, uh, right from how do you set it up, how do you schedule, right down to the nitty gritty of care. And so what we did is we came up with another document that specifically says, how do we take care of polycystic disease within our kidney clinics? And the goal is that it's a complement to this, or as, as I put on this little the picture here, it's kind of like a plug-in. If you're thinking about your uh, you know, a computer uh, uh, software, you have your basic software, your basic tools that works for everything, but then if you have a specific task, you get a, a plug-in. And this is what I think about with, with, with polycystic disease care is, we have our existing kidney care, which applies to everybody, including people with polycystic disease. There's, com there's common things that, that work for everybody with, that are important for everybody with kidney disease, but then there's specialized things with, with polycystic disease that we have to add on top. And that's how we kind of built these resources as to say, what are those add-ons and how do you apply that? And it's important because what we say is that the goal is that this is not a standalone. This is meant to, to be a, 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 on top or an add-on to what we already have. And this is something that you'll find different approaches in, diff in different provinces, but I actually feel kind of strongly about this for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, you know we have this great network of kidney clinics across the province. So why would we not take advantage of, of that strength that's already there in the, in the networks that we have? But the other is you kind of don't wanna separate out a group of patients. Because like I said, there are some common things. People with polycystic disease, for example, at some point in their life might need to talk about transplant. They might need to talk about dialysis. And if you've got them in a separate place over there getting their care, not in your kidney clinic, well then things are a bit fragmented. And when it comes time to do these other items, they're not part of your usual care you know, family, then, right? So uh, I think keeping everything the same and building up our teams to offer specialized care is, is the way to go. And that's the model we've taken. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but this is just to show everybody that this, when I say that it goes through everything about running a clinic, it really does. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if people were to pick this up, we've had people use our, our, our kidney, our, our kidney clinic uh, one. And my, my true hope is that eventually people will want to pick this up for polycystic disease as well, because this is printed in detail that people could, you know, duplicate this, you know, anywhere, pick this up. Don't worry, I'm not going to make everybody go through all of these. Just it's to show there's a lot of stuff in there, um, and it's all up on the website. We had to develop a whole bunch of specific tools uh, to uh, to support the care. Um, so this is our BC Renal website, just bcrenal.ca. If you want to go poke around um, to orient yourself, if you're going up there, you'll see that there are um, uh, health info and health professionals. This is the health professionals tab, but the health info, which I'll show in a second, is the patient uh, uh, facing uh, patient specific things. We basically train people up to, to, to get there, to, to have the right tools and to have the right education. And you can see this, there's a lot of stuff there. It's not just that best practice document where I showed you here, but under each of these tabs, there's a whole bunch of stuff, right? Dietary things, blood pressure, what kind of medications to use, even as simple as forms that we use in the clinic when people come to see there's one called a learning needs questionnaire. That was the point about when you come into the clinic, you tell me what you need and we'll make sure that we work around it. Um, there's a whole host of tools that we had to develop to support those best practices. Again, we don't just want to hand someone something and say, go do it. We want to put the tools in their hands so that they can. We went out of our way to 
um, maximize uh, what people could do for imaging. So one of the cornerstones, again, I'll, I'll defer you to the previous talks about, about uh, how all these things work, but one of the main, main items, one of the most important things in polycystic disease care is imaging of the kidneys and using that to determine what's going on with the disease. And so one of the things that we heard is, well, a lot of this were, relies on, on MRI, but we don't have access to that in our part of the province. So, you know, are there ways that people can, can do other items? And we talked about a uh, CT scan without getting too much into the details, the difference between an MRI and a CT scan is to do a CT scan, it's like an X-ray. So it has, a, it has a small amount of, of radiation that goes along with it, but it still has some, whereas an MRI doesn't. So that was always a worry of, well, you don't want to keep just CT scanning people over and over again. We don't want our patients to be glowing in the dark by the time they're done with them. You know, we want to, we want to limit the amount of, of radiation we're doing. So we actually came up in BC with what we call our, our ultra low dose protocol. So the UBC ultra low dose protocol for a kidney measurement with CT scan that actually gets that radiation down to, it's about the same as getting an X-ray done. Or as before it would be, you know, 10 times that amount. Um, so we were able to really, really minimize this. And the goal, it might sound kind of academic, but the goal for that is to say, well, actually now if you're in a place in the province that doesn't have an MRI scanner, you can do this with a CT and not have to worry about giving a lot of radiation to the patient to do it. So again, enabling people to use what they have in their local area rather than having to travel eight hours to come get an, an MRI. And then in addition to uh, the tools we have for the clinicians, this we have a whole bunch of things for people living with the disease. And these are the ones I really want to encourage everybody to go and look on our website and pull them up. You know, we put a lot of work into these and I hope that they're useful to people. So if you go on that health uh, info uh, tab, um, oops, I pressed wrong thing. If you want, I was looking at this like it's a button, but it's a PowerPoint slide. If you want that health info tab, there's things like, you know, you can learn about the disease itself. Actually, when you go there, it puts you over to the PKD Foundation website because that's where the best source of uh, information is. And then if you go into the managing, you'll see some of these things we develop, like how, what about dietary uh, things? What should I be doing with my diet? Um, you know, there's a couple of other tools that come to in a second. Uh, some items around treatment with, with, with the medication called that one. So information specifically for the patients, everything that we develop from, for the staff, we, our goal is to come up with a mirror image one for the patient to read themselves. And it's a two complement each other. And then we were fortunate enough to be working with the, the great group like we have here on the call with, with the PKD Foundation and the Kidney Foundation as well, where we actually collaborated to make some of these resources together. Um, and the ones we took on were things like pain, chronic pain management or pain management in polycystic disease, uh, family planning and pregnancy, and screening or testing of asymptomatic family members. And, and the reasons we took these on was um, there wasn't a lot of great information actually out there. One of the reasons, especially for something like chronic pain, I'll, I'll be blunt about it. One of the reasons that there wasn't a lot of great information about there is because it's a hard subject. It's a very hard topic to come up with with recommendations for. But our, our kind of goal, and I'm so glad to have the, the, the PKD Foundation and the Kidney Foundation too who agreed with this, was to say, well, just because it's hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And we just kind of jumped into it headlong and took it on and came up with some resources. So I'm super happy. And these are up on the website now that, that everybody can, can take a look at. Um, and then the last item is about treatment with, with uh, for polycystic disease. And I mentioned colvapin because that's the one uh, uh, disease modifying treatment we have uh, for, for the disease. And before, so prior to the, a couple of years ago, um, this, there was no public coverage for this, meaning that if people had private insurance like Blue Cross or something like that, a private drug plan, uh, they, were, they were able to access this medication. Uh, but some people uh, didn't have that type of coverage and couldn't access the medication. And when I look at that, it's not just about overall the number of people treated with the medication. I'll, of course, I, I want to treat everybody who can be treated, but to me, there's also an equity item there, meaning it, it shouldn't be that if you have, if you're fortunate enough to have a drug plan that you get better treatment than somebody who doesn't. That doesn't sit well with me. That's not kind of our, our Canadian way of, of looking at things. And, and you know, that, that didn't really sit well. And so we were very fortunate that we were able actually uh, to start funding this. So, so through BC Renal, we're the first province to fund the medication. And now we can take away that inequity part. Now we set a bit of a higher bar, meaning people need to prove that they require this treatment. 
we didn't just make up criteria. We, we adapted it from a group of Canadian experts to, uh, to translate to say, yes, this person does require treatment. They meet criteria, kind of preserving the medication for those with the more aggressive disease is the long and short of it when it comes to tobacco. Again, I'll, I'll defer you to the previous talks about that. But we want to make sure people have, uh, meet the criteria. And then if so, we, we get them uh, treated. And this is only possible because of this network that we have in place where we're able to share experience amongst the group, right? So people who aren't maybe familiar are able to get more familiar. We need to have databases and information to know about patients. When you're starting to find something, you can't just kind of open the doors. You need to know what are you signing up for and you know, what's the budgeting and all that. Well, we can only do that because of what we, we've done uh, here. So it's one of those uh, items where you can see that it actually, our network has enabled us to go a little bit further with, with, with what we can offer. And then the last couple of things I want to show you is, is where have we gone? Because I talked about some of those needs. I've talked about the tools we've developed, but actually where are we here in NBC now? Now, uh, I showed you at the beginning, back in 2015, this was our little uh, uh, group of patients with polycystic disease we knew about. And uh, the, the yellow one is people who've had transplants, the gray one is people who are on dialysis, and that blue one is people who aren't either of those two, meaning earlier in the disease. And as, as we talked about before, that was a small number. But the next year, we hadn't really done a whole lot. But then after that, you can see that these bars are going up. The number of people we know about is going up and up and up. And it's all the blue bar, which is growing. And that's what we want to see. We want to know about more and more and more people before they get to those later stages of their disease. And the other way that, I, that we kind of put here on this graph, sorry, it's a bit of a busy graph, but this dotted line shows people who've got a kidney function or a GFR of above 30. Again, to say, are we really making, are we really capturing people earlier? And you can see that that line is going up and up and up and up. So we're identifying more people and we're identifying people earlier in the disease. This is a good thing, because as we talked about with those circles, if we don't know about people, we can't help them out. We need to know, first know, uh, you know where people are. And this just kind of reinforces that, uh, that concept that we're really capturing people earlier. I shouldn't say captures the data term we use when I say it like that, it makes it sound like I'm putting people in prison, but we're identifying people earlier. Um, and these different bars, again, you get the different color coding is for different levels of kidney function with the blue bar being the highest, then yellow, then, then gray. And when you look across, you can see it's just that blue bar that's shooting into the stratosphere. The people with the highest kidney function are the ones that we're really increasing our knowledge of. We're capturing people, instead of again, we're identifying people earlier and earlier in their disease course, which is what we want. All of our strategies work best the earlier we know about people. And what we've done with our kidney clinics is we've shifted practice. So people are coming into the clinics earlier. It used to be that people would only come to the clinics essentially when they're getting ready for dialysis. Uh, whereas now we're starting to bring people earlier and earlier. This kind of heat map to, or this, this uh, area map shows um, the different levels of kidney function. So the blue bar is the ones with the highest kidney function. These, the yellow and orange are the lowest kidney function. And back here in 2015, you can see those, those yellow and orange was the bulk of what people were, the people with low kidney function. And over five years, we've actually completely flipped that on its head. We're now the majority of people who, with polycystic disease who come to our kidney clinic actually have high kidney function. It's a complete shift in what we've been doing in our kidney clinics uh, in just five years time. So I'm very, very proud of that and happy with that. One of our goals was to get our, our staff trained up and, and educated on doing this. And, and what we've found, at least from the staff feedback, is that they, they do feel much more uh, confident in their ability to, to uh, uh, provide care. Some of this is, is surveys around our educational sessions where people just said, yes, that that was a good session. They could be lying to me for all I know, they just and tell me what I wanna hear. But what the questions we were really after is, do you feel like you have the right tools on hand to provide good polycystic disease care in your clinic. And these numbers are now going up to almost 100% of our staff, whereas in the past, people were quite hesitant with this. So our staff are feeling more and more empowered to, uh, to deliver this specialized care. It's a big thing, right? Because a lot of people will say, well, you need a specialized clinic with a specialized nurse and a specialized pharmacist to do this. These are our regular kidney clinics. And with these tools, our, our staff are saying, actually, I feel quite confident enough to, to do this. So when I go back to our, our network, you know, this is our, our goal. And then this is where, where I want to shift care. This is the, I always think in pictures. So here's another picture, but my goal is to kind of push things a little bit. 
So if we think about people living with polycystic disease, how do, how do we push things? How do we get care to the next level? Well, if we go every step of the way, we want to move them into what we think is a better box. So we want to take people who haven't been yet diagnosed and get them diagnosed, get, get the family physicians and get the, the people screening for, for the condition. If people know about the disease but don't see a nephrologist, we need them to see a nephrologist. We want, we want everybody to have a kidney specialist. So we try to push that. If they see a nephrologist but don't yet go to one of our clinics, again, we want to push that. And that was that change in the bars. We want to get everybody into our kidney clinics because we think that we can, uh, we can uh, change what we're doing there. Now, we don't just want to send them to our kidney clinics for the fun of it. We want to make sure that the kidney clinics are, are able to uh, provide best practice polycystic disease care. And that was that last item about enabling our staff. We want to make sure everybody's familiar and comfortable with doing this. So we shift everything. Our hope is that we're bringing polycystic disease care into a, into a new level. As, as time goes on, we'll know for sure. We're still, it sounds funny to say this, you know, now that we're five years in, but we're still in early days. I think over the coming years is when we'll really start seeing have we changed the long-term experience of people living with the disease. Our hope by shifting all of these items into the red box is that we will, but we'll see. We'll actually be looking at that and evaluating that as time goes on. Um, as time goes on, I think we're going to keep strengthening our link, links between clinicians. And, and actually, this is one area where I'm happy the, about virtual care. There's not a lot of things I'm happy about with this, but, but when we're talking about having interconnected people across the province, um, things like, you know, you being able to use video conferencing and things like that goes a long way. So I think these links are going to get even stronger. We're really working on our links with primary care. That to me is, is the hardest hurdle to, to pass is to say, we want everybody diagnosed. You know, we don't know what we don't know, but the real link or the real push is to get everybody tested. Why I say that's hardest is, you know, we've only got uh, 70 uh, nephrologists in the, in the province. We have thousands of GPs uh, and a lot of people to outreach to, to, to get uh, people, uh, get that awareness out there and get the testing happening. But we're working on it. And that's, 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 that's a goal worth fighting for, you know. Um, and then as time goes on, we've got more stuff that's in progress. And hopefully, you know, next time we'll be able to update with much more things around like genetics and imaging. We've got some great you know, things on the work there. And of course, there's going to be ongoing research and just having a network like this, it enables us to not only improve our own care within BC, but it really puts us in a good position to learn more and more about the disease that hopefully, uh, you know, is a benefit to everyone. So that that's a whirlwind through what we've done in BC. You know, I, I just want to... Uh, close here by again thanking everybody. So our whole team of people that have got listed there again. I want to thank all of you for taking the time actually to listen to what we've done in BC. That's very uh, that's, that's very encouraging that you would take out of your, your time out of your day to, to, to hear what we've got to say and I hope it was useful to you. Um, and of course I want to thank the foundation, the PKD Foundation, both for hosting this talk today and actually playing a role in all of these tools that we developed, a very active role and the Kidney Foundation the same. Um, and then with that, let's see if we have some, some questions uh, coming in. So Mike, before we jump into questions from the panel here, um, I'm going to throw a million dollar question at you, which I know a lot of the um, attendees and participants today that are outside of BC are probably asking themselves, well, how do we get such an incredible 360 care in our province, whether that's Ontario, Quebec, anywhere? Um, this was a lot of work. This was a huge undertaking, one that I haven't seen before, and obviously one that hasn't been done uh, in the PKD sector here in Canada. Can you speak a bit on the hurdles that you faced in order to make this come to light? Because like you said, this was a whirlwind. This was kind of a 101 to make it happen, but there was a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Like what I loved most about partnering with, with BC Renal and, and our engagement with everyone in BC, even the AFOC included, is the, the partnership and the teamwork is, is second to none in that province. It's something that's, that's outstanding and is, is surely a reason why you have succeeded um, in getting this rolled out. But what, what can we do, I guess, from a patient standpoint, from a, a patient foundation standpoint, to advocate for this type of care extra provincially? Yeah. yeah, yeah, million dollar question. Um, you know what I'd say is, it, you're right that if we didn't have that infrastructure in BC already existing, this would have been I, I think even harder, if not impossible. So we're we're lucky to have the coordination in BC Renal, where we we're, we're used to thinking about things a little bit more on the provincial level. Um, 
but as far as advocating to help have this help to help this happen elsewhere, um, that's where I, I think this I hope this is helpful to show one that it's possible because it's such a big undertaking that people might not have thought about that and and just said, well, you know, it, we can just kind of send people to one or two clinics and get their care and that's fine. We don't have to think right. about this, but you know, by by showing that working together actually we can leverage the strengths of what we have. I, I think this demonstration piece hopefully is helpful for that. As far as the uh, the ongoing, you know, advocacy uh, uh, targets, that's where I'd say break it into those little chunks. That's why I like pushing that or those those figures and and, and showing about pushing the envelope from one side to the other. That uh, you know it kind of breaks it into a little bit more manageable needs rather than just saying I'm going to revolutionize polycystic disease care in my province. They could say, well, what's your what's your first goal? Our first goal is maybe to get our staff up a little bit up to speed. And now there are tools out there to do that. And, and then, then after that, maybe we can start bringing more people in and kind of think about it in a, in a layered approach. Because that's really what we did. We couldn't do right. it all at once. We did it step by step and, and, um, and always thinking of what's your next lowest hanging fruit, right? What's your next target to go after? That's why I like that concentric circle type document. It kind of keeps in my mind, okay, let's just push it to the next level, just a little bit further, a little bit further, and that's the goal. And then the, the last thing that, that, that I would say is that if people are, are really struggling in, in a province, you need to set the need rather than just saying this is something we want. That's that's where things like those numbers and stuff like that help, right? Where we went back and said, actually, we don't even know about anybody living with polycystic disease in the province. Like that was a very powerful thing. I think we all assumed that we did, but putting the numbers down, and, uh, you know, and saying actually, how many patients do you know do we know about with polycystic disease? Oh, that's a very small number, you know, and the numbers kind of hit right. people in the face. You kind of need uh, proof then to show the need, demonstrate the need. And I'll always remember it was at one conference we were both attending and you spoke to me about nephrology almost as a whole kind of shooting yourselves in the foot over the years because for so many years, decades, there was no improvement in care. There was a lot of behind the scenes being done, but there wasn't much that that nephrologists could say other than drink your water, watch your salt, you know, exercise um, and see you in six to 12 months. Now that's obviously changed. Um, 2015, we saw the first treatment approved here in Canada, the Canadian guidelines, you know, that are kind of the, the hot checklist for PKD became present. Um, so the last five to 10 years has been a lot of moving and shaking in the PKD sector. And I, and I like that you just said that we kind of take it in smaller steps because those tools weren't even out when you started this in 2015, you know, um, but it's 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 showing that the the proof is in the pudding of seeing that that blue column growing because that's what what everybody should aim for in identifying PKD patients whether that's dominant or recessive at an earlier age um, to ensure that they're getting the best care possible um, throughout their journey. So that's that's fantastic and and thank you for expanding on that, Mike. Um, I'll pull one of the questions here from Heather. Uh, my son in their 20s, my sons in their 20s do not want to get tested yet because they don't want the disappointment of knowing. What would you do for them at this point medically that would help them to change their minds? They don't want to go for blood work constantly at this age, for example, because in early stage, there's not much uh, besides knowing that they have it. So again, this is part of why more people are identifying, self-identifying um, as patients is that there's stuff that can be done there's treatment option available so what yeah. would you what would you say to that question about a, a mid-20s that's not looking for the next step yeah I'll, uh so the one that kind of I say is you know i don't know the individual situation and, and talk to your, your 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 care provider about that but my general statement about this is that you know for a lot of reasons with care evolving and knowing that that uh, a lot of the changes we can make are more effective earlier in life. We do like to know about people earlier. Now, what earlier means in, in ADPKD, uh, so not, this is not recessive, ADPKD, uh, is you know somewhere in kind of the early 20s. So you're at the, you're around the, the point where I tell people, this is when you wanna start thinking about it. You know, It's not a hard and fast rule by your 21st birthday, you must have to have this done. It, this is around the time to think about it. I flipped back to the screen because that's why we made this specific document. And I almost won't do it justice by trying to talk about it in 30 seconds, but I really, I would say, maybe go pull this up on our website. It, it's on there now, our screening and testing. This is one of the ones we made with the Kidney Foundation that actually 
takes people through what are the pros and what are the cons. And I think this is an individual choice that you want to weigh both of those things. My personal opinion is for most people that the pros outweigh the cons of doing the testing, but we've kind of laid it out very nicely in that document. What are the ups and downs? So I'd say maybe, you know, hopefully we take a little read through that and it might help frame it a little bit uh, and, and kind of say, you know, what are the arguments for doing this and not doing that? It's an individualized choice, but my general recommendation is, you know, in this day and age, it's better to know and probably better to know, you know, relatively early. Uh, thank you for that, Mike. We have two questions that are uh, somewhat similar. One is asking uh, extra provincially outside of BC, have you learned of any improvements um, that is happening in the system uh, in any other provinces um, that they could benefit from the work? And then another gentleman, uh, Kevin, is asking, have you shared that or has anyone learned of that in the US um, as an attendee from Chicago? So uh, in, in the US? Take and I'm not as sure in the U.S. Just that I don't have my finger on, on that pulse as much, but I, I know that you know care there is also um, evolving. They just what was it last year? I guess the year before now that they had approved uh, a usage of 12 aptin, which why well, I mentioned that is that it's kind of a kick in the pants in terms of, of getting your, your care up to, to date when uh, when there's a treatment available. And so I know a lot has happened in the U.S. even just over the last couple of years. What I can say about other provinces is definitely yes. Although we're the first ones to take this on a provincial scale, a lot of people are heading in this direction. And more importantly, there's a lot more people offering uh, more specialized positive disease services than used to be. You know, I'm not sure even the exact number because it seems to change day to day. But, uh, you know, we know that even a couple of years ago, let's say if we go back to 2015, there were, depending on who you ask, two or three clinics in the country that were offering, uh, you know, specialized polycystic disease care. And now there's dozens, many right. in the province. Uh, and, and so that it definitely is, is, is advancing. And, you know, uh, uh, although myself and my group took this, this on in BC, there is, there's similar people in every province who are, are pushing the envelope. And, and I, I think I'm very encouraged that we'll keep seeing this happening even more and more. There's a lot of collaboration happening across the provinces uh, that never used to happen before. Uh, uh, in terms of, of, of aligning our, our care. So I, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think the short answer is yes, places are moving this direction. And I think we'll keep seeing that uh, and get better and better. And certainly, and, and, and by no means do we want to, to leave one with the impression that, you know, BC is doing something that isn't being done um, anywhere else. So Correct. It, it would be a good time, I think, to plug, uh, refer PKD, uh, you can either go to referpkd.com or npkd.ca, our website, slash referpkd. Um, if you type in your location, it will populate uh, the closest Canadian PKD specialty clinic. So you will see that there are um, more growing by the day, um, which is tremendous. You know, I think I too remember Dr. Bevelac with the days of, you know, there was, there was Dr. Pay and there was Dr. Bichet. Yeah. Um, and that was it. If you weren't in Toronto or Montreal or willing to jump a plane, um, you were out of luck. And thankfully, you know, we have seen them sprout up um, from coast to coast. Now there's, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of areas still to cover, um, but we're in a better, stronger state uh, than ever before from a PKD care standpoint. Yeah, I know, you know, just because this is the approach we took in BC, uh, it, it doesn't mean that this is the only approach there is. You know, uh, there's more than one way to skin a cat. This is what works for us specifically in BC. Also specifically knowing we have a really concentrated one area of the province and then a geographically dispersed rest of the province. That's one of the reasons that this model works for us, but this right. might not be the right model in other provinces. So yeah, yeah by no means would I say that, that this, you know, that doesn't mean that everybody has to do exactly this and that nothing's happening elsewhere. That's definitely not the case. There's so much happening. Even just the last five years, it's remarkable to see how much more there is to, to offer out there. Okay, we do have a couple minutes. If there are any last minute questions, if anyone has uh, something that's pressing, um, Dr. Bevelacqua's knowledge knows no bounds. So <laughs> I don't know if I'd say that, but if you're looking for baseball right. scores tonight or hot tips yeah well i'd like to take this opportunity and while while people may be typing in their last questions dr bevelacqua to thank you for once again making yourself available um i've seen this presentation before we were hands-on with the development of some of the tools but i i just love it so much because it was such a a welcome 
partnership and collaboration, um, and we've seen the benefits grow in British Columbia. So from a patient-driven foundation standpoint, I, I get excited to think that other provinces will be able to do a fraction of what, what BC has accomplished. It's just been absolutely astounding. So thank you for taking the time, Mike. No, my pleasure. Uh, one last question here, and then we'll, we'll call it a day, is what is the status of genetic testing? Mm. So yeah. I'm not sure if that's your, if they're asking your opinion on it. Sure. Um, I can say a little bit both after my opinion. And maybe sure. I mean. So, you know, to date, there hasn't been a lot around genetic testing, just because um, it sounds funny in a genetic disease, but we don't actually need genetic testing for the, for the majority of people living with polycystic disease. And, and for that reason, it hasn't really come to the forefront just yet. But I think it's changing for a couple of reasons. We're learning more and more about the genetics all the time. And so I, I think we, we will come back to a point, uh, you know, in the future where genetic testing is, is playing more of a role. And the other thing that's enabling that is that genetic testing itself, so not just for polycystic disease, but in general, the concept of doing genetic tests is dramatically different. It used to be a very difficult and very expensive thing to do. Whereas now, I mean, as you know, you can get a 23 and me kit and send it off somewhere and pay <laughs> bucks. Now for polycystic disease, it's not quite that easy, but genetic testing is advancing so much that I think we're going to see it come back into polycystic disease care and be a little bit more routine. It's one of the things that we're actually working on right now in BC. Uh, so stay tuned because we're not there yet, but about how do we streamline that and other places are doing it too. So I, I think you'll see it come back more and more into care in the coming years. Okay, uh, last question. If our nephrologist is doing the wait until your GFR is less than 15 uh, conversation and we'll talk about dialysis or transplant then, um, can we suggest that they contact you? So um, I guess what they're asking, if, you're nephro if the nephrologist is one of those, we'll, we'll just deal with transplant and dialysis when you get to the numbers, what could you recommend for that? Um, that's tough. I wouldn't think necessarily recommend to me. They might, some people might, not that I'm not open to it, but some people might take that the wrong way. I, I think maybe the, the way to approach that one is always to say, well, bring them a specific question. You know, like if you go look at the talks where we have about evaluating the disease and, and, and imaging and things like that, you know, um, say, does this apply to me? Or, or does this treatment strategy apply to me? And maybe try to push it a little bit that way rather than just asking, oh, can you talk to somebody else? They might be taking a bit back. It's, it's always a tough situation, but I think advocating for yourself is important. And it's always good if you do it with a specific item. You know, say, oh, here's something that I wanted to talk about. Great point. Okay, Dr. Bevilacqua, thank you again. It was a wonderful presentation. I know those in attendance um, will either have a lot that they can do and advance in BC, or if we're uh, from outside of the BC area, what we can try and champion uh, extra provincially to make happen. Um, I would like to take this opportunity as well to thank those that joined us today. Um, we don't usually do the midday one, so it was wonderful to see so many of you turn out. Um, please stay connected with the PKD Foundation of Canada. We are doing these events uh, almost on a monthly basis. Um, you can join our newsletter on npkd.ca, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's your best way to stay connected. Um, and we look forward to hosting our next event um, in about a month. Thank you guys and wishing you a great day. Take care, everyone.